I don't know. Oh, you found it. That's just, yeah. Are you, are you going to be holding this for me? I don't think so. I'm going to I won't actually. You panic you if you want to, yeah, sure. why not? Hi, just dropping on here real quick. Um, just want to let you know we are good to go. We are live. So feel free to start the tour at any time. Is it like the countdown? Is it going? Sorry, countdown's done. We are live and you are good to start. Okay. Hi, and welcome to our Fun with Food and Farming three day speaker series. I'm Salema and I'm a master's student here at Brescia University College in the Food and Nutrition program. And I will be interviewing Matt today, who will be talking to us a little bit about food processing, as well as taking us on a quick tour of the Brescia Food Labs. So with that, let's get started. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. It's so great for you to join us today here at Brescia University College. We are Canada's only women's college, or women's university, I should say. And what's really special about Brescia is we have one of three accredited food, pro food and nutrition programs in Ontario. So before I take you on a tour of our lab spaces and classrooms, I want to tell you a bit about myself. So I started off my education career after high school. I went to the University of Toronto, where I did a double major in molecular genetics, microbiology, and human biology, and a double minor in psychology and immunology. And if that really confused you, that's okay, because it confused me as much too. So I came to Brescia to do my second degree in nutrition and dietetics, and I ended up working here after because I found food, working with food so much fun and so rewarding. I hope to share some of that enthusiasm with you today. So since we're heading now into the labs, we do have to wear our lab uniform. That's basically a lab coat that protects you and your clothes from any dangerous chemicals or getting stained and dirty. So my, as you can see, I'm wearing long, long pants as well as my feet are covered. So in case there's any, anything that breaks or falls from the counter, my feet won't be hurt. And come on, we'll, we'll take you now to the food storage room. So welcome to our food storage room. This is kind of like a mini Costco actually. We have lots of different foods that are stored, received and stored in this space. And I want to take you over through this aisle to this back wall here that you can see behind me. And I want you to guess how many different spices we have on this wall. And you can just drop those down in the comments. Yeah. So as you can see, Suma, if you want to pan around this whole space, this is where all the food that we use in our labs and classes is stored. We have multiple fridges and freezers in this whole building. I believe it's eight fridges, six freezers that will, and we'll, you'll get to see all of those today as we take you on this tour. So now you probably had fun guessing. I'll reveal the answer now. It's actually 125 different spices all on this wall right here. And now I'm going to take you to take you through to one of our food lab, uh, food prep lab spaces. So this is what a lab looks like at Russia. Now, some of you may have seen a lab before and you're expecting more of a chemistry kind of science-y looking lab, but here we specialize in food science and food processing. And part of that is actually food preparation. So food preparation, the kind that you do at home is a secondary form of food processing. Uh, there are also two other types. For example, there's primary food processing, which refers more about refining agricultural products. So taking stuff from the farm, making it into a usable form for you in the kitchen or at home. And there's also the third form of food processing, which is a commercial food processing. So when you're eat, thinking of like snack foods and prepared foods, and maybe you call them junk foods, those are good examples of uh, tertiary food processing. So I know some of you are probably wondering, are processed foods bad for you? Well, to answer that question, it's a little complex. Processed foods really just refer to foods that have been changed from one form into another. 
So we can say, like, for example, here on this counter, we have a lot of different examples of different processed foods. Uh, we have oats here. Now, these most people consider them to be a healthy or a good food for you. These are processed because you take the original oat grain and then they are flat, they are steamed and flattened to make these quick oat, quick large flake oats for you to eat. Same thing with canned tomatoes, for example. These are processed from fresh tomatoes, obviously, in a form that then you you can then keep and store for a really long time. But then you also have processed foods that are like Cheetos and chips. And I think most of us understand that these are foods that you don't want to be eating too often since they're not as good for you. But again, these are processed in a different, in similar ways to some of these foods as well. So now I want to take you through to our other classroom. Uh, You'll just follow me through this hallway. I have to make sure I have my keys. We actually have students in the process of uh, making and creating recipes for different foods in this lab. So we'll just pass by quickly and wave hi to them. So everyone, this, these are our fourth year, fourth year students, and they are currently creating recipes for different foods. Over here we have a, what are we on? Four different batches of muffins? Yes. And over here, Paisley is making different kinds of hummus. And over here, we, Kathy is making different kinds of brownies. And yes, these are university students, and yes, we are having a lot of fun in our lives. <laughs> Now I'm going to take you through to our commercial kitchen just so that these students can work quietly without us disturbing them. I'm going to close these doors. So you'll come on through soon enough. This is our commercial kitchen, which is kind of the space where it's supposed to be set up to mimic like a restaurant or a hospital kind of kitchen. So you can see all the beautiful equipment we have here is actually made to prepare food on a really big scale. So this is another example of food processing, like cooking food, for example. Uh, and here we have a very large pot. This can make up to 100 servings of soup. Here, this is a, basically a really large skillet or frying pan. So you could make cook up to maybe 50 steaks at once here. This is your gas burner and range. So you've seen this before probably at home or on TV. This is a large oven. Again, we have prepared hundreds and hundreds of rolls of bread, muffins, and loaves and such in this. And over here, some of you might have parents at home that love baking and they have a stand mixer. Well, this stand mixer is almost as tall as me and weighs a lot more than I do. <laughs> so this can prepare large batches of cakes and brownies and everything. And it's really, really pink and powerful. As you can see, and of course, after all the are cooking and baking and everything, once you're done, you do have to clean up. But thankfully, we have this really big dishwasher, which takes care of the job in less than a minute. So I'm going to show you like how fast it goes. This the steam is shooting up out of it and sterilizing and washing everything in just under a minute. Your home dishwasher takes maybe an hour to do one cycle. This can wash 600 number of dishes in that in the same amount of time. Now, after we prepare all of that food and we've cleaned up, we're obviously going to try to sample and taste our food. So I'm going to take you to this space, which is designed to actually test how people eat their foods. So this is our sensory lab. That really just mean, refers to how food is enjoyed by all different kinds of senses. So of course, you know taste, but you also look at your food. You can hear the food. Sometimes it's crispy and crackling if it's just been deep fried. You can smell it. You can feel it, especially if it's a finger food. So in this space, we analyze all those different senses as you enjoy your food product. Sulema, I'm going to ask you to come through here and see our setup. So on this side of the setup, this is where the public will be sitting. And they will be sitting here. And through this door, you can see food samples would be passed through. Now, you're probably wondering why we have the different lights there. Like, why is it blue? Well, actually, we can control the color of the light so that it can be any kind of million colors of the rainbow. Uh, typically, when we're doing food tasting, we would use normal white light or daylight, sometimes red light, because the different colors will actually mask how the foods look under a certain light. And I'm going to show you an example of that right now. So, Suma, if you could sit here at station number seven. Okay. 
to all of you watching from home for participating in this sensory evaluation. So for example, we might give you samples of different juices to try, and then you would have to tell us how much you like these juices. So here we have sample A, B, and C, and under different lights, they'll actually well, look different. So I'm gonna come back around and change the color of the room so you can see how this looks red now, but it might look clear after. So for example, this red juice, well, it did look red under the blue light, but now it looks clear. So an example of this, like obviously you don't usually find different colored juices around like the supermarket, but sometimes you have a lot of different like fruit juices that are red and pink. And you might always think the really red juices are supposed to be sweeter or more sour perhaps, but with different lights now you can't tell which is supposed to be sweet or not. So thank you so much for being our wonderful participant today. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and I'm gonna take you through to our food science kind of chemistry labs. It's a little bit more scary up there, but bear with me. Come on. Do we have any questions from the audience so far about any of the spaces that we've seen? Thank you. Some of you are probably wondering about different careers that are available that are related to food processing. So typically, I like to give examples like people who work in the food industry, they might be involved with food tasting. I have a friend and a colleague who actually is working to develop different flavors of ice cream. But I, I also have friends who work with McCormick Spices, for example, and they're developing different ways to make sure that spices keep longer in your cabinet. So now, what about you? Do you know anyone who works in the food industry and what career, what cool jobs they have? Um, I did have a friend once who uh, worked at a carrot factory, Oh yeah. I believe. Yeah, I think they were making either carrot juice or baby carrots, actually. Oh, that's really cool. And of course, in these jobs, you get to eat everything you make. <laughs> so that's always a perk. Now I'm going to show you three more spaces. The first of which is our food science lab. It's a very special kind of space. Um, yeah, it's a special space where we apply more chemistry knowledge to our food science principles. So come on, please. <laughs> so come on through, everyone. This is our beautiful food science lab. As you can see, it looks a bit more like a chemistry lab. There's a beautiful view on the side there of the forest and the hill. What's really cool about this space though, I really want to show you this. These vents actually come out of the counter. Feels kind of fancy, kind of futuristic, doesn't it? <laughs> but there's also a lot of food science equipment back here that might be a little bit complex to play now, but I'll try to explain it in a way that makes sense to this. So this is a water bath. Water baths are used to heat food up to a certain temperature with, while using water. So it's kind of like a simmering, simmering kind of device. This is an isotemp oven. It actually can go up to 200 degrees Celsius, which is far hotter than you would ever use. <laughs> Sorry. I, I realize the noise here is a little bit but we do have to have ventilation because we are working in the chemistry lab. This is a drying oven. So some of you at home might be wondering what a drying oven is used for. A really common example is where dried fruits and nuts and seeds, they can be made a dry, drying oven. And this is stuff that our students actually learn how to do. And over here, we have an environmental chamber, which really looks like a large box, but it's a really special box. It actually can, you can control the temperature inside and the humidity. So really it's kind of like creating your own weather inside. As you can see, we like to have a lot of fun in our labs. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's another student doing her research project on the side. And just over here, we have one more thing we want to show you. So this is a distillation unit. So this actually can produce different food extracts, which for example, like vanilla extract, which you may have used if you bake a lot at home. So this can purify these different compounds from the natural origins of the chemical. Finally, we have two more spaces I do want to show you before I give you a quick canning demonstration. So follow me through this. Do we have any questions from the audience, Silma? 
Um, what kind of high school courses do you need to take to go to school to become a food laboratory technician? That's a really great question. So typically, I, I would say that you need to be really enthusiastic and excited about science. Um, if you're in high school, that means really paying attention in chemistry and biology. Sometimes in physics, it depends on kind of where and who you're working with. But definitely listen to your science teachers and do really well in science. So here we have a chemical storage room. This is actually restricted access to only special certain people, but you guys get a sneak peek today. And here, this is where we store a lot of dangerous hazardous chemicals. So right over here, actually, we have a fridge, a special, sorry, a freezer that goes down to minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is actually as cold as the North Pole. And in there, we keep different samples that need to be stored at a really cold temperature to make sure they don't spoil. Uh, and then you'll follow me through this kind of smaller lab area. This is where I'm going to show you how to do canning. So as you can see, this is basically another lab, but it's, it's a little bit smaller. It's made for our graduate students so they can have their own space to do their experiments without bothering the rest of our events. And now I'm going to walk you through the process of canning. Because as we've covered, canning is one of the many different types of food processing uh, that occurs at a primary level. There's also freezing of foods. So like when you freshly harvest foods and freeze them immediately, that's considered food processing. There's also drying of foods that we covered. You can also um, mill foods like milling wheat into flour. All of these things are considered processed foods and food processing. So it's, right now, I'm just going to give you a really simple example, just a quick walkthrough of uh, canning pears. So you've seen these, uh, probably seen canned pears and canned fruits at the supermarket before, but this is actually something you can do at home yourself, preferably with parental supervision. Now, before we begin, we have to make sure everything is clean. So we're going to wash our hands properly. I have my hand soap right here, and we're going to wash our hands. So get your hands nice and wet, and then you're going to apply it soap to them, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. A good way to remember that is to sing the alphabet or the happy birthday song. I'm not going to do that to you today, though, but make sure you get in between your fingers, under your nails, as well as your wrists, too. And then you want to take paper towels or a dish towel and dry your hands off. Now your hands are clean and ready to handle food. Okay. Now, so to start with canning pears, why do we can pears? Well, Unfortunately, we don't always have summer all year long, so fruits and vegetables aren't always in season. These pears are really lovely, but sometimes, but especially before we had different methods of um, growing foods all year round, you'd have to save and can fruits so you could enjoy them throughout the whole year. Some of you may have canned tomatoes at home and made them into tomato sauce during the summer, and you were able to enjoy delicious tomato sauce even in January. So today, I'm going to just quickly show, show you how we can pears. Um, start off with a nice batch of pears. You always want to pick the nicest fruit to can, just because six months later when you eat the food, you want to actually enjoy the food that you're eating. So for what we're going to end up uh, after this demonstration is a jar of canned pears like this. Some of you may have done canning with your parents at home before as well. You can can lots of different vegetables and lots of different fruits, but there are a little, there are some tips that I do want to ensure that you know, and I'm going to walk you through them right now. So to can pears, we start off with the pears, and these have already been washed. You would peel them using a peeler, obviously. So I'm just going to show you how like, you peel them. Like this. And then you would then slice them. I'm not going to do that because we don't have the time right now. You slice them and pour them. I've kept these in water just so they don't brown this quickly. But you also need to have clean canning lids and canning jars. So to clean them, you need to sterilize them, which means to kill any bacteria or any dangerous things that might be on them. And the way we do that actually is to put them into a pot of boiling water and to boil them for a long enough time that it actually kills everything that might be growing on them. So these jars have been cleaned and sanitized. Now we want to put our fruits into them. Again, I have my clean hands here, so it's okay to do it this way, but some of you might feel more comfortable if you're using tongs or utensils. Just doing this really quickly for you as a demonstration. We do have a question. Huh? Yeah. If while we're doing that, yeah. Um, sure. Have there been any substantial changes in canning technology, or is the way you're canning today similar to how people canned things 150 years ago? 
to be honest, canning is a really simple process of food preservation, and it's it has been around for quite a long time. So that's a really great question to ask. Um, in the industry, there may be uh, advances in the technology in terms of efficiency, in terms of how quickly they can can, in terms of different, I guess, things they might add to the uh, fruits and vegetables that they're canning to keep them lasting longer. But the principle is the same. We're essentially putting foods into a sealed container, where the can, or in this case, the jar with the canning lid, and we're sealing them away so that they are inert, which means that they won't start to grow mold or start to rot or spoil in as quickly as they would if they were just left out in the open. Hope that answers your question. So you want to pack your jar full of the fruit. And then this is a simple syrup that I've uh, already uh, created. It's just some parts of sugar plus water. And we're going to pour it in over our pears, making sure to cover the pears. And you'll notice that there are some bubbles that are here. That there might be some bubbles still in the jar. So you could take a knife or a spoon if you feel more comfortable with that. Just, just move them around just to make sure the syrup covers all the surfaces of the pears. All that. Might need a little bit more syrup just to make sure. You do want to leave a little bit of headspace. So then we're going to put on our, this is a two-piece canning lid, so it has this lid and the rim around it. So you're going to put that on. And I guess somewhat, not too tight. You don't want to make the lid too tight here, but just tight enough so that nothing comes out. And then we're going to come over, and then this is a pot of boiling water, or we'll pretend it's a pot of boiling water. And we put it in, and we're going to uh, put, make sure there's enough water to cover the jars and boil them for about 15 minutes. It depends on what you're canning and what, what you've added to the jars. But for these pears, we are able to can them in 15 minutes in a normal kind of pot. Some people use a pressure canner, and that's what you would use in the industry. With a pressure canner, it then actually can can and cook the pears more quickly, and that, that works a lot more effectively as well. But a lot of people might not have a pressure canner at home, so that you can still can using a, can a large pot, but it does take a bit more time. So once that has been cooked off, this is an example of a jar of pears that was actually prepared two years ago. So <laughs> I was able to find this in storage. Um, technically, you wouldn't. this might not be safety after two years, but as you can see, there's no spoilage or anything. The pears still look just as good as the day that we uh, sliced them and canned them. And yeah, you cannot, there, this was a really good canning job. And essentially, this is the same product as the pears that you see in the can over here. But you were able to make this at home using food processing techniques that you know and learn at home. You might have saved a bit of money as well if you make it yourself. So basically, I think that pretty much covers everything I want to talk to you about today. Now, if there are any questions from the audience, I'd love to answer them. Or if there's anything else you want to know about this kind of field, Sulamas or anything. Uh, we do have a question here. For sure. Um, what is your favorite thing to can? My favorite thing to can? Uh, I'm a really big pasta person, so I really love, um, like when my friend and her family, they grow a lot of tomatoes during the summer. I really love when they invite me over to help um, can all those tomatoes. Like they make tomato sauce and they can tomato sauce. So that's something I really like. With fruits, I would prefer to eat them fresher when possible, just because with the sugar syrup, it does make them a little too sweet for me. But uh, that is another way to enjoy your fruits and vegetables as well. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? Thank you for that. Um, I have a question, actually. Okay. Um, so what are some benefits to food processing? So why food, do we process food? So why do we process? That's a really great question. Well, food processing actually covers pretty much everything that happens from, from when the food is harvested at the farm to when it gets to the grocery store. So there's a lot of changes and a lot of steps that can happen to, make, to bring you that food. Because if you've seen wheat in a field, like you can't eat that on its own. You have to harvest it, you have to dry it, and mill it into flour. Um, so that's a, benef a benefit in that sense, is that it actually makes food easier for us to digest and to cook with. Uh, it's the same thing with meats, for example. You'd, you'd have to uh, break down larger cuts of meat into maybe, if you're making a hamburger, you need to process that meat into ground meat. Uh, yeah, so those are some examples of why we do food processing. Another example actually is fortification, which means that you can add extra nutrients to your food. So um, they're then good for you, if that's how you 
Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, another question we have, sure. is it safe to, for people to can meat and animal products at home or should first time canners stick to fruits and veggies? I'm gonna recommend that, like, I have seen people can meats before and that's definitely something you see in the grocery store. So you've seen canned tuna, canned meats are available. Um, it's definitely something that you want to leave to the experts and you may want to look more into making sure that your meats are fully cooked, reaching a certain food safe temperature before you can them. Because you don't want to be putting in all this work to can meats and not knowing what you're doing and then six months later you, you have a jar or something that's completely inedible. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Another thing people can do with meat is freezing it. Exactly. And that's another way to process food exactly. as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So canning originated as a method to actually preserve food for a different time. So like now we're lucky enough that we have freezers and freezing is a great way to save your fruits and vegetables and meats and other foods um, for later. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? Or? Um, have your habits and what you look for at the grocery store or restaurant changed since you've become a food laboratory technician? Uh, I will say they actually have. I'm, I've become more aware of what goes into the process of making our food, what kind of additives there are. I do, I make it a habit to look at the labels. So I, I like looking at the labels and nutrient labels, seeing kind of what ingredients are in there. Um, it, there are a lot of words on labels that sometimes they look, might look confusing. Uh, it's always great to like look things up, ask an expert. If you have questions about the nutrient content of a food, definitely ask your parents to ask a registered dietitian. Registered dietitians or RDs are the experts in nutrition and they're the only experts in nutrition that you should listen to. Um, otherwise, in terms of my personal habits, yeah, definitely I, I do look, food, look at food differently. And a, food, a career in food is something that you want to consider. I think it will definitely change your view as well on how you do it. Thank you. Do we have, so we have no more questions. Okay. So th thank you. Oh, so there actually is one more one question. More? Okay. Actually. Yeah, I love this. Yeah. Are there any common misconceptions about food or food additives that you see frequently? Yeah, I, um, I definitely think that when people think of processed foods, they, they always think of like highly processed foods or ultra processed foods, which are often really like, like if they're made with flowers, they're really refined. They're taking away the bran from the grain or from the wheat. So, or they're thinking of snack foods or junk foods, for example, soda pops, chips, stuff that we can enjoy once in a while, but we shouldn't be eating as part of our normal, regular diet. Um, so what was the question? Any misconceptions, misconceptions about food additives? Yeah, so I, oh, food additives. Um, food additives can also be, can also include fortification and added nutrients to certain foods. So. Uh, it really depends on what was added to the food and why it was added. So that's definitely something that if you go into schooling and you go into, I guess, a food career, you'll learn more and more about. Certain things that are added might not be necessary at all. Like I know certain um, snack foods, they add a lot of colors that may not be desirable to some people. Whereas other foods, they add a lot of nutrients that actually make it better for you to consume. Thanks. Thank you for that. Is that pretty much it for our time? Okay, well, I want to thank you all so much for joining me today, here today in our beautiful labs. I want to thank Eggscape for providing this platform so that I could share all this information with you. I want to thank Sulema and uh, Medea behind the scenes, behind the camera for their excellent work today in supporting this. And of course, uh, if any of you ever consider a career in food, honestly, it's a great place to be. It's, a, it's so important, the food system. Like we all eat food, it's never going away. So if you are interested in Korean food, I encourage you to work really hard in your science courses. Maybe math as well. Sorry, <laughs> I was good at math here, but science is for sure, your chemistry and your biology. And definitely, if you have any other questions, definitely ask an expert, ask your science teacher, call up with your parents, see what they think. And next time you go to the grocery store, definitely take a look at like some ingredient labels and see what you think about those. So. Um, I guess that's it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me and take care and stay safe out there. Thank you so much, Matt, for helping us educate about this topic. Thank you. Thank you.